Chapter 51 The City Beyond Okay, said Oddie. First things first. I think the tokens are indestructible, or at least very tough. Look at the gas bubble. Tougher than we expected. I think we now we know that was the fire token, and this egg is the air token. It was not a dragon's egg, nor a firebird's, so it has nothing to do with fire. The bubble does. It holds a gas which burns. Anyway, if the tokens are tough, it's worth looking for it. What did the mandala have to say? I don't know, Lydia said in a small voice. I forgot to look. Well, we'll see if we can find the token, if the mandala will give us a clue, Oddie continued in a businesslike way. Then we should probably wait here until Sophie shows up. Oddie looked at Lydia, then asked gently, What did you say to her? Lydia's face was pale. Remember when Freddy took the bubble token out of your shirt? Oddie asked, taking a different tack. Lydia gave a weak nod. He nearly dropped it, Oddie reminded her. Not only did it not send him back, he couldn't keep hold of it. It was the same with Sophie. She didn't go back, so she must be the same as Freddy. She has a special role. I know. What I'm saying is that Sophie dropped the token because she couldn't hold it, and because she was trying to stop you having it. Lydia heaved a sigh and hung her head. <sighs> I said I wasn't nice to her. You were both upset. Sophie was probably freezing as well. Lydia nodded her bowed head. Let's start by finding the token, Oddie said matter-of-factly. Lydia consulted the mandal with Freddy's help. It showed the egg still whole, and the pool told her it was amongst some mossy rocks half a kilometre from their camp. Lydia, Oddie and Freddy set out to find the egg. It wasn't difficult to get to. Pick it up, please, Lydia said to Freddy. The egg, unharmed by its fall, slipped out of Freddy's fingers three times before he gave up. I can't, said Freddy. It's like that bubble thingy. It didn't send me back, and it's like it wriggled out of my hands. Oddie smiled at Lydia. That's what Sophie said, Lydia admitted, picking up the egg. Do you want me to take it back to Ambrose? Oddie asked. No, Lydia said. I can't do this without you. Anyway, you're the mentor. You have a role, so you probably wouldn't go back. But you're not trying. I don't want to take the risk. Oddie smiled again. Freddy grinned at him. Shut up, Freddy, Lydia growled. Come on, we should get back to the camp and let Corbin take the token to Ambrose. It'd be nice to see Jimmy again. Maybe Soph will be there, Freddy added. Sophie was not at the camp, but Corbin took the token and Jimmy replaced him. Lydia had to explain to Jimmy and the others what had happened with Sophie. What did you say to her? Jimmy asked. I was panicking. I might have suggested she'd done it on purpose, Lydia replied. The signs pointed that way, and the stress of the quest put me on edge, and... No reason to be a git to someone who's like a sister to you, Jimmy said. Look, you were stressed and stretched before I went. I'm not surprised something happened. But Sophie must have been hurt to think she'd let everyone down. Well, she's not too ashamed to come back. She shouldn't be ashamed. I'm the git. We can't change what's happened. Jimmy said, looking into her eyes. I have to carry on and welcome Sophie when she gets back. They settled in to wait for Sophie for the rest of the afternoon and evening. The others told Jimmy what they'd been doing, the bears, the trolls, the fairy flights, and he related to them what he'd heard from Ambrose about Harry's hunt for Roll. The companions stayed up later than usual, despite the cold. Sophie did not return. The following morning, the remaining companions ate a slow and quiet breakfast. Afterwards, they packed the tents, taking longer than ever before. Even though, because of Jimmy's return, they still had three brooms, the ferry flights took more time than they would otherwise have taken. They moved camp to the furthest edge of the mountains. From the slope of the last mountain, they could see the city of Shakika in the distance. It lay on the slopes of a hill topped by the citadel. Quinn told them a great river wound round three sides of the hill. 
The river was not visible from where they were setting up their tents. For the first flight, Lydia took Xander and Jimmy took Quinn. Dean stayed behind but flew around looking for signs of Sophie. After that, the flying went as usual, with Jimmy in place of Sophie taking Shona, then Dev. The distance was further than their previous ferry flights. When the last flight reached the camp, Freddy had gone into the boys' tent to consult the mandala. Lydia left the others having a late lunch and went inside to see Freddy. Shona and Christy passed the tent at one point. They heard Lydia crying. They said nothing to the others. The mandala had not shown them anything. They were just above the tree line, with the forest at their feet. If the next token had been amongst the trees, the mandala would have told them. They inferred that the next token would be in the city, forty kilometres away. They discussed Shakika yet again with Quinn, and settled on a plan to get inside its walls. Find somewhere to stay the night, then follow the mandala's lead, should it be in a helpful mood. If the mandala is going to be vague, they would start searching in the magnificent library housed within the citadel. Quinn suggested that might be difficult. The Shakikins had suffered several attempts by other city-states to burn their library. The city guard was now controlling access. Spirits were not high. Lydia decided they would stay where they were until the following morning. She was not sure why. Perhaps leaving the mountains represented leaving Sophie behind, giving up on her. Perhaps flying to a safe distance from the city and having to hike there seemed daunting. Or being in a city where they would meet strange unknown people and have to try not to stand out was her worry. Whatever the reason, the guilt of how she had treated Sophie, the nearest person she had to a sister, combined with her anxiety about what was to come, left her unsettled. Lydia felt a listless tiredness. She wanted to lie in her bed, at home or at Hogwarts, and not have to get up until she was ready. She wanted her mum, and her dad, her real dad, not one of her substitute fathers like Ambrose or Draco. What she wanted was a dad who had to love her, even after the hideous way she had treated Sophie. Then she thought about Sophie out there on her own. She would have a tent, and all the supplies she needed, but Sophie didn't have a father to love her better, and she was out there with no friends, and no one to guide her. Sophie knew they were making for Shakika, and she knew its general direction. Perhaps she would meet them there. Then Lydia could tell her how sorry she was, and what an obnoxious git she'd been to Sophie. Lydia cried as quietly as she could. Lydia forced herself out of her bed early the next morning. Then, for good measure, she forced everyone else to get up. She felt guilty about waking Freddy. He hated getting up early, unless it was to wake everyone else. He'd been so good to her the previous afternoon, when she'd broken down crying in his tent. She loved him for that. She steeled herself and told the lazy good-for-nothing he had to get up with the rest. You look tired, Oddie confided over breakfast. That's not something a girl likes to hear, Odysseus, she whispered back. I wasn't trying to compliment you, just this once. You need to know so that you can take care to be extra patient with the others. She stared at him. Where had Oddie learned so much about emotions that he had turned into this wise Odysseus? He must have read it somewhere. Ambrose would have given him a recommended reading list. She smiled. It didn't matter how. What mattered was that he was putting it into practice, and getting it right. What mattered was that he cared enough to try. She put her hand on his for a moment. She noticed he blushed from his neck upwards, like her mum did. Oddy, you know Professor Trelawney? Lydia asked. Not really. I know of her, but I don't take divination. I came remembering something she said, Lydia went on. She sort of made a prophecy about me. It has all come true. The bit I remember most was that she talked of a bitter smell on the wind. A smell of betrayal. I thought it meant someone was going to betray me. But I was the betrayer. I betrayed Sophie. Oddie looked down, then looked back up at her. That's why you've been crying, isn't it? He said. You betrayed your sister. And you failed to live up to the standards you set yourself. Standards that, actually, no one could ever meet. What should I do? Forgive yourself, of course. But while we're all holding our breath waiting for that miracle, consider something. 
Remember you told me how, in one of your watcher dreams, you found thoughts in your head which were not you, when he was trying to make you look into his eyes? Maybe he's doing it again, but more subtly this time. He could be behind this so-called betrayal of yours, on top of all the natural stress and worry. Give yourself a break. It's the watcher who's the git. Lydia took a moment to purse her lips and blink back the tears. Thank you, Odysseus, she murmured. You're welcome. Now organise this rubble and get us moving again. He squeezed her hand, then gestured towards their friends. When we've finished breakfast, Jimmy, Dean and I will start the ferry flights, Lydia announced to the group. On the first flight we're going to find somewhere within walking distance of the city, where nobody can see us flying in. Please bear with us if it takes a bit longer. And could you look out for Sophie? Everyone agreed to keep watch. The scouting party found a wood a few kilometres from the city. The citadel of Shrikika overlooked it, but the trees sheltered their landing site from the farm and the road which lay beyond. A stream ran through the wood, carrying mountain meltwater down to the river on which the city stood. They left Quinn and Xander to scout the area and keep it secure while they flew back to get the first batch. When they returned, Quinn waved them down. He seemed agitated. It was almost unimaginable. As Xander came across a squad of Shikikin city guards patrolling the area, he said as they landed. That is unusual. It may just be that they are skirmishing with one of the other city-states, or they might expect us. Did they say anything, Xander? Lydia asked. I wouldn't imagine they would care to discuss their plans with the cat, Xander pointed out. But I followed them for a while. I picked up that they were under orders to watch out for intruders. There was nothing about what intruders they might expect. One of them aimed a kick at me. Rather than punish him for his impudence, I was discreet and reported back to Quinn. Where were they? Lydia inquired. On the road, away over on the other side of the farm, Sander told her. Perhaps a kilometre from here? Do you think they'll be back? Shona asked him. Oh, they said nothing of their plans, he explained. But they are on patrol, so I would expect them to return regularly. Lydia looked to Oddie. Oddy turned to Xander. While Lydia and the boys go back to collect the others, can you keep a lookout for any more patrols? Aye, Xander agreed. Watch how I dash like a cheetah. Xander sauntered away a few metres, turned to look back, then, with a swish of his tail, shot off through the wood. What about you, Quinn? Oddy asked. Would it be a problem if the patrol saw you? I am a wanderer of renown. I have friends in the herd of houses. City, he said. But in times of strife with other cities, wanderers are not welcome. The guards might regard them as spies. The only warm welcome a spy may expect is one in which they are tied to a stake. Then you should all stay here, Lydia said. We'll go for the others. See you soon. She jumped on her broom and took off keeping close to the treetops. Dean and Jimmy followed. With the companions reassembled in the wood, they were still greeting the latecomers as Xander returned. I have great news and I have so-so news, he announced. What's the so-so news? Lydia asked. I overheard the farmer and his son talking about the political situation. There is some friction with another of the cities, Parmea. The guards have had a tip-off that Parmian agents posing as fur traders will try to sell infected pelts. They're hoping to start an epidemic in the city and make the citizens too weak to repel a siege. Won't the plague render Shikika unusable? Oddie asked. Quinn answered his question. They will simply sit outside the city walls until most within have died. Then they will send slaves in to kill the survivors and drag out all the bodies. The dead, and the slaves who may now have the contagion, will form one enormous bonfire. Then the Parmains will wait a while until it is safe to enter the city and take it over. The poor slaves, Shona said. Have they done this before, these Parmains? Never asked. Yes, though, never to a city of this size, 
Wynne said. It seems fraught with problems as a plan, Oddy remarked. The city's residents could burn it out of spite. The number of slaves would be large to clear a city. They could revolt. Another city-state could attack the besieging troops and take Shakika for themselves. Other states could ally and strike both here and at Palmyra. The list goes on. Quite so, Quinn agreed. The Palmyra hopes one day to reach a size and wealth which would render them unassailable. And they are not there yet. I imagine this is a rumour designed to have the citizens of Shikika wasting their resources. That also is something Palmyra has done before. The point is, Lydia said, as long as we don't turn up trying to sell furs, we should be okay. Is that reasonable, Quinn? I hope so, he answered. You have someone they knew who can affect the introductions. Vagabond though I am, I am a professional. What was the great news, Zander? Freddy asked. I have returned to you unharmed, Zander said. For now, however, I should probably stay out of sight. I would rather like to keep my fur for myself and not be mistaken for a random pelt. I have a room for you in my bag, Zander, Freddy offered. Seeing as Sophie isn't here at the moment. Xander thanked him and climbed into his rucksack. With an air of apprehension, the companions set off for the fabled city of Shikika. <laughs>